In 1960, the Open celebrated its 100th birthday at St. Andrews. But since the end of the Second World War, it had been a championship in decline. Its salvation came from across the Atlantic. I hope that, that I have had some impact on the Open Championship. I did the right thing by coming and playing in the Open. In May 2009, Arnold Palmer attended the R&A Spring Meeting. He played on the old course, possibly for the last time. Fifty years previously, Palmer was the superstar of golf. His personality and his aggressive play drew an army of fans. In 1960, he won the Masters and the US Open and decided to travel to Scotland to continue his quest for major titles. Well, I came for numerous reasons. One was the fact that, that I did not feel that you could ever be or call yourself a great champion if you didn't play internationally. And the most attractive tournament to me was the Open Championship, which uh, was the one that I had to come and play and hopefully win. Palmer arrived at a championship that had become the poor relation of the majors in terms of prize money, infrastructure and prestige. Most players from the USA preferred to stay at home. But the arrival of the American Tour's marquee player signaled a sea change in the fortunes of the championship. There was a buzz. Arnold is a man who fell out of bed with great charisma. And he came along at a wonderful time uh, when golf wasn't being televised around the world regularly. And that was the kind of person you needed. Palmer became an idol of mine just the way he dealt with the galleries and the way he won his championships, the flair that he had, the fans and everyone appreciate what Arnold Palmer has done to the game and what he, he meant to the Open Championship. Since Palmer came onto the scene and television and media have got themselves more involved, obviously uh, majors have become far more important. I was uh, first a little awestruck it was a totally different atmosphere than I had ever seen in my life, and one that uh, I must say that, that I grew to enjoy uh, very quickly. All the things intrigued me. Palmer's arrival marked the end of a difficult period for the championship. After the Second World War, the championship was inevitably affected by the enforced rationing, shortages, and general austerity in Britain. St Andrews had also been the venue for the first post-war Open. It was won by the American professional, Sam Sneed. Well, I mean, it caused great excitement in St Andrews when, when Sam Sneed arrived, but he, he was very derogatory in his opening remarks and just how he reacted even coming in on the train. I had a man sitting beside me and I said, Who's, is that a disbanded golf course? And he jumped up and he said, I'll have you know that St Andrews. I said, you mean they're playing uh, the, uh, the open here? Oi, he said, the championship! He didn't think much of the facilities in the town. I mean, he did make that famous quote, when you're, when you're outside the States, you're just camping out. 
In 1946, Sneed was one of just four Americans who qualified for the championship in a field of 100. He finished four shots ahead of compatriot Johnny Buller. However, his visit had provided a cultural shock. Britain was cold, austere, drove on the wrong side of the road, funny beer, spoke in a funny accent, and paid for things in a peculiar currency. Well, it cost me 2,000 to uh, come over and play in the tournament. And I win the tournament, got $600. And they said to me, are you coming back to defend next year? I said, you kidding. Seven years later, Ben Hogan arrived at Carnoustie. The most renowned player to enter the championship since Sneed, Hogan also found Britain stark compared to the USA. It was generally known that he, he wasn't where he liked to be. For a Texan to come on a boat to, to play in the British Open at Carnoustie was uh, something that was very special. Uh, we understand now that he was on the point of leaving before it ever started until he was persuaded by a gentleman that gave him a great place to stay just out of Carnoustie in a, a hunting lodge, I think it was, uh, which kept him there. And by coincidence, I played in the pair behind him the whole way around. He took a long while to make a shot, which means that some of the tees I was waiting, looking at him down the fairway as he made his second shot. But I, I gave him great reverence. He was a marvellous player. Hogan won by four shots. A near-fatal car accident in 1949 had contributed to him becoming a tough, hard-nosed competitor. He was infamously single-minded both on and off the golf course and became only the second man to win all four modern majors. His striking ability was just pure. Henry Cotton said to Hogan, put down 20 balls. And he said, you know, right, with his brassy, which was two wood in those days, he says, right, without changing your grip, how many balls can you hit on that green? I mean, Hogan's grip was just like a vice. So, you know, his, the legend, the story goes, he hit 19 balls out of 20 on the green, which is impossible. You know, nobody, most players re-grip off hitting a wedge. Broadway is a fairway for a day. Hogan's Alley, they call it, in honor of Ben Hogan. In 1953, the scheduling of the Open and the PGA Championship made it impossible to compete in both. Otherwise, it's not unfeasible that Hogan would have completed the Grand Slam that year. But he never returned to play at the Open. Well done, big little man of golf. There was simple matters that the facilities for the press were poor. The scoreboards were non-existent. There was this old-fashioned scoring of level fours, which left the crowd and the, indeed the players rather confused as to as to what was going on. Hardly a precedent. There was a, eventually, I think there was. A, it may have been twelve by twelve tent uh, with about a trestle table in, and uh, they were a, a new breed then, golf writers. And one of the old members going around to somebody obviously said, "Are there any press people?" Yes, yeah, there's, there's a couple of them in there. The press tent was still reasonably primitive because I do remember George Wilson, the uh, RNA executive, coming uh, down the aisles in the press tent at Royal Birkdale with a watering can to lay the dust. You know, <laughs> you know, there was no carpets, there was no wooden floor. And above all, that the leaders were not going out last. Difficult to believe that they, there was no sense of theater, so that the players and the, the spectators didn't know who was winning. Whereas elsewhere, notably in America, there was a sense of theater and, uh, and drama. With most American players absent, those from the Commonwealth flourished. During the immediate post-war period, Bobby Locke from South Africa sailed to victory four times. Locke was renowned for his outstanding short game and his swing was ideal for Lynx golf. Locke, in my opinion, was a genius. Uh, I'd love, 
I love him to reincarnate it today because he was a wonderful tactician. I actually met him once. I was going for my school uniform. Uh, I think I was 11 or 12 years old and, and he was sitting in the, the same tailor shop. He, uh, he called me uh, Master Else, <laughs> you know, which I thought, whoa, what's that all about? But um, he, uh, wonderful guy. And, uh, you know, I sat next to him on the couch, I remember uh, quite clearly. And, you know, my mom obviously told him I was an aspiring golfer and uh, he was really nice to me. Locke was more than just a good putter. Uh, he was as good as anybody else uh, off the tee and up to the green. So he was a good all-round player and deserved his wins. Between 1949 and 1958, Locke and Peter Thompson from Melbourne won the Open eight times. Thompson first won at Royal Birkdale in 1954. I was a bit cocky in those days, I suppose. I, I thought, well, I'm going to win this. And that's what happened. <laughs> the final shot of mine was a little two-inch putt, which I tapped in sort of left-handed. The first thing that happened to me coming off the green was people came around to congratulate me. And, and uh, George Duncan was there. And uh, he was an old winner. And <laughs> He stopped me and he said, if I ever see you do that again, I'll kick your bottom. <laughs> so I said, all right, well, just let me enjoy the moment first. Professional golf star Peter Thompson is back after putting us right on the golfing map. He won two of the toughest of all golf titles. Television in, in my early days of starting to play the game of golf at, uh, at an old age, really, at 15, 16, um, it was on television. Um, and those times, it was always um, Peter Thompson was in the, the fray of things many times. And I hope I can win it again, of course, but there'll never be another time like the first time. Everybody looks up to the generation before them um, to make sure to try and emulate what they're doing. Thompson finished either first or second for seven consecutive years and was the only man to win three successive titles in the 20th century. His victory at Birkdale was followed by wins at St Andrews in 1955 and Hoylake a year later. In 2006, Thompson returned to the venue where he'd completed his hat-trick 50 years earlier. Despite the prize money at the Open lagging behind the other majors at that time, Thompson was blasé about his winner's check. One of the RNA officials came to me and said, can you really hurry to the prize giving? We won't have it right away. And I said, well, I, I haven't got a jacket. And then I saw my friend Max Shaw uh, around me, and I said, Max, can I borrow your jacket? for the prize giving, and he said, sure. So he took it off and he gave it to me and I put it on. And there's a picture of me with Max's jacket taking the cup. But uh, the odd thing was that a couple of months later when he was back in Australia, his wife sent the jacket to the dry cleaner. And before she did so, fortunately, she went through the pockets and found a check for 2,000 pounds from the RNA in it. <laughs> It was another South African who was triumphant at Muirfield in 1959. Despite being eight shots behind the leader after 36 holes, Gary Player became the youngest winner since 1893. And I went and sat by myself, just as a little prayer of thanks, of gratitude, to win this great championship, and looked out in the great uh, Scottish countryside. And my wife always said, you know, if I never lived in South Africa and I had to choose somewhere else, I'd choose Scotland. And uh, I sat out there and just reveled. It was just a, a something that was just like a dream come true. Despite the undoubted excellence of the Commonwealth players, the Open still struggled to keep pace with other modern golf tournaments. From 1953 until 1967, the championship was overseen by the R&A secretary, Brigadier Eric Brickman. He was a, a, a typical army official, but I liked him. And uh, 
They've never had rakes at the bunkers. I mean, you used to rake with your feet. This is what young people don't understand. It. You'd rake with your feet or you'd do it with your club, and that's how the bunkers were. And I got in the bunker at the, at the ninth hole at Lytham, and there were all these holes, and I could hardly get out. I went into his office. I said, Brigadier, may I come and see? He said, certainly, and I went in there. And I said, I, you know, I love the Open Championship so much. I'd like to donate 18 rakes to the tournament. <laughs> I told him about this and the incident and in America they have all these rakes. He said, get out of here, you little insolent so-and-so, get out! <laughs> With you know, a typical brigadier and I said, yes sir, and out I went. The following year, Arnold Palmer arrived at the Centenary Open. Handsome and charming, he was the most charismatic player at the championship since Walter Hagen. It took someone with vision and character and, and a sense of history of the game and say, well, I don't care what you think, I'm going. This is the oldest major championship in the world. 1960 was the first time that grandstands were used at the Open. On the course, the Australian Kel Nagel led Palmer by four shots after three rounds. But play was then suspended due to a deluge. Oh, do I remember the rain? Certainly I remember the rain, and I remember looking out of my hotel room and, and onto the 18th green, and, and of course the Valley of Sin quickly filled with water, and that uh, was an indication that we might have a problem finishing the tournament that day. Never seen so much rain. The water poured over the over the uh, the clubhouse steps. The Valley of Sin was full. There was so much water about that they called the fourth round off. The championship would be concluded the following day, and Nagel could contemplate his lead overnight. I said to him, I said, you can win the championship. Oh, I don't think he believed me for a minute. I said, no. I'm serious. That I said, you can beat me for a start. I said, oh, look, I'm 100 to 1. He said, look, you're driving well, you're putting well, the short irons are good. He said, we'll practice a little bit, and uh, that's just how it sort of worked out. When the final round was eventually played, Palmer hit a splendid approach to the 18th. And look at that, look at that, look at that, look at that. There is a very, very great golfer indeed. As Nagel reached the 17th green, his lead had been cut to just two shots, and he faced a 10-foot putt to save his par. And Arnold by this time was on the 18th green, and I decided to wait and see what happened. It's right in the middle. What a wonderful thing. There was a big whirl went up and Arnold had hold. So I decided, uh, well, I had to, had to make this part, otherwise I had to make birdie at the last to win. Nagel's lead was now just a single shot. It's probably one of the best parts I hit, and then I walked out onto the 18th tee and um, Don Lawrence came up to me, a reporter from Melbourne, and he said, you know what you've got to do to win? I said, yeah, I know what I've got to do, because I was watching Arnold make these, all these strokes. I pitched to about three and a half foot at the, at the last, and, and two putted for the four, and one by a shot. Oh, he's got to get it in, though. He's got to get it in, take trouble. He's got it. Well done. Well done. And so, Kelvin Nagel... The funny thing about him winning and me being there to witness it on the 18th green was that I actually gave him my jacket to wear <laughs> for the prize-giving because he hadn't come prepared with his own jacket. It didn't quite fit him, truthfully. <laughs> they gave me a replica. As, as well as the medal. But I was unfortunate that I had a, a mysterious uh, robbery. Peter Dawson was out um, in Australia and 
he came and visited my home. He said, Kel, well, let's see if we can do something about replacing the medal. Uh, a few months went by and the medal arrived in Australia and I really appreciate that, it was fantastic. He spoiled my party. Uh, but there were a lot of good players even then uh, and, and people who were considered uh, potential winners of the Open Championship. And I can say that uh, it was one of the great experiences of my life. The following year at Royal Birkdale, Palmer added his name to those already inscribed on the claret jug. The Open had been revitalized. It was, it was a lifetime ambition and it was something that uh, wasn't casually thought about. It was a, a very deep thought in my mind and something that I was determined that I had to do to consider myself even a good player. And when he came and he won, it was as if the key was turned in the lock and the door was opened and suddenly everybody followed. Well, if Arnold's done it, then we better go too. He led the way, there's no doubt about it. He led it as clearly as a man riding into battle with a standard rippling out behind him. This is ABC's Wide World of Sports. ABC Television, which was the kind of the fledgling sports operation at the time, was looking for opportunities to do something no one else was doing. As soon as Arnold Palmer stepped into the scene, it was obvious that there was an American presence and that this was an event that needed to be on American television. ABC's Wide World of Sports was a weekly magazine show. Although not broadcast live, Palmer's successful defense of Royal Troon was shown in the USA. It was the first glimpse of the Open for American television viewers. Why do you like to come over here? You could stay home and probably make more money in the tournaments at home. Well, Jim, one of the reasons I like to come is you saw in the 18th green. The enthusiasm, the uh, golf courses, and uh, people, and everything in general. I like it very much. Even Sam Snead had returned after a 16-year absence. 1962 also marked the end of qualification for the champion. Palmer had not only moved his compatriots to play, he'd influenced the direction that the Open was taking. When I said to the RNA, uh, I would not play any longer if I have to qualify. Well, that was after I had finished second and won it twice, and, uh, and they seemed to understand, and, and of course, for the best interest of the Open, they dropped the qualifying. For the stars on the American tour, Palmer's victories in the early 60s were inspirational. Within a decade, players from the USA would dominate the Open for the first time since the Roaring Twenties. It was uh, something I wanted to do. I was the uh, American champion at the, at the time uh, in 62, and uh, um, the natural progression for me was to go to the British Open, so I did. Arnold Palmer winning in uh, 61 and 62. Uh, it made an impression on me. Uh, uh, the British Open at, at, at that time, there was a history that I'd learned earlier on about uh, the Open Championship, and it's all due to Arnold Palmer that uh, kind of piqued my interest. Well, I think it's always been the greatest championship. It's just that we didn't know anything about it until Arnold Palmer laid the path for us. When Arnold Palmer started going there in 1960 and winning it back to back, um, it finally got its recognition. 35 years after his first appearance at the Open, Arnold Palmer returned to St. Andrews to say farewell to a championship on which he'd made such a huge impact. I remember the year Arnold played his final Open championship there, coming across on 18. I was on the first green on that Friday afternoon, and everybody stopped. I mean, the whole course came to a, a close while the fans were applauding him and TV and the cameramen all taking pictures, and it was warm that day. And I remember, you know, the, 
the tingling sensation and the hairs on my arm standing up, just watching the fans plotting him. What would I like to do now? I'd like to play the Open. But I'd also like to be young and strong and, and have a mindset like I had when I did play the Open.